talk a little bit about food um, and nutrition, um, which I love to talk about. So when we talk about prebiotics and probiotics and polyphenols and what all of these things do, um, my husband actually didn't even know the difference between pre and probiotics. Um, so uh, we won't give him flack. That's okay. Uh, I helped him sort it out. So basically with prebiotics, it's good to get a great variety of these things. So prebiotics are going to increase the density of your microbiome. So all the strains that you have in there, it's going to help nourish, nourish and nurture those strains in there and help increase the density. And prebiotics, we're going to go over the difference between these two on the next slide. Probiotics increase diversity, so very different than the density. So by introducing new strains, by taking pendulum glucose control or acromancia or our GI repair program, uh, product, those are going to increase the diversity of the strains that you might be missing or lacking. Polyphenols, which um, are things like uh, these beautiful pomegranates, cranberries, um, all sorts of teas and spices, those can increase acromancia. It's been shown in the literature to increase the abundance of acromancia, which is really fascinating. So what all this slide says is, hey, we need a good variety of these things. We can't just eat fiber, which is wonderful. We want to do that, but that's not going to introduce new strains that we might be missing. That's where the probiotics come into play. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between pre and probiotics. So prebiotics, think of them as foods for probiotics, things like apples, garlic, almonds, um, Jerusalem artichokes. Uh, we have some asparagus here. So those are all foods for probiotics. And then probiotics are foods for good bacteria. Um, so basically in yogurt, in miso, in the pickled vegetables, you're going to get different bacterial strains. Kefir is a wonderful example. Um, you know, I don't know too many people who love kefir as much as I do, but I think it's great for you. And the types of prebiotics. So basically these are fibers, right? And not all fibers are going to be prebiotics. Um, so insoluble fiber, this stimulates gut peristalsis and digestion. Does it feed the gut microbiome? It does not. However, it's still great for a lot of things. Helps with colon health, helps with digestion. And some examples include things like whole wheat flour, wheat bran, nuts, beans, veggies like cauliflower, lettuce, green beans. Resistant starch and soluble fiber, these are fibers that are going to help feed that gut microbiome, which is wonderful. And resistant starch are carbohydrates that resist digestion, and they function very similarly to fiber. And some examples include oats, beans, um, ripe bananas, unripe bananas, so the green bananas, uh, legumes, cooked and cooled potatoes, and cooked and cooled rice. Those are all examples of your resistant starches. Some soluble fiber, this dissolves in water and forms a gel-like material. It's going to help lower cholesterol. It's going to help slow the absorption of sugar because what it does is it forms a gel along your intestinal wall. And that makes it much harder for you know, glucose to get in there and get absorbed. So it helps prevent those sugar spikes as well. Some sources include oats and barley, peas, beans, fruits and veggies, psyllium is a wonderful source of soluble fiber. Um, so with these, I always encourage people to try and get a really good variety. The different types of fiber are also going to help with different bowel issues. So think soluble slow. So if you're having diarrhea, soluble is going to be the one for you. Insoluble is on the opposite end of the spectrum. If you're having constipation, that's going to be a really good one for you. And most fruits and vegetables have a good variety of your insoluble and soluble. Now on to polyphenols. So what are they um, exactly? So these are a category of plant compounds that offers various um, health benefits that can act as antioxidants, meaning that they can neutralize harmful free radicals that would otherwise damage your cells and increase your risk of conditions like cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. Um, so there's over 8,000 polyphenols and that makes it really hard. And I want to remind everyone that just because something says, oh, there's a lot of polyphenols here, doesn't necessarily mean it's quality. Um, we recommend taking the food as opposed to, um, you know, trying to get it from your foods and all of that is really good. But there's some people who do need a supplement for this. 
Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but here's some really great examples of some top polyphenol containing foods. Um, we have flax seeds, dark chocolate, red wine, who doesn't love red wine, cloves, blueberries. Um, a lot of what I see are just the cranberries and the pomegranate. Those are two really big ones um, in terms of polyphenols and acromancia. So acromancia in general, um, it's a fairly new strain. It was discovered pretty recently in 2004, and it accounts for about one to 4% of healthy adults' microbiome population. It lives in the mucosal layer. So if you're getting a stool test, I want to caution everybody, just take it with a grain of salt. I think that they are wonderful tests. However, because acromancia lives in that mucosal layer, um, sometimes it's not picked up because it's not in that stool layer. So um, keep that in mind uh, when you're getting those tests done. Um, low acromancia, um, people with low acromancia, typically it's been found in the literature that they have a higher body weight, BMI, blood cholesterol level, and fasting blood glucose levels. Um, and this bacterium is more abundant in the gut of healthy subjects than in that of people with diabetes and obese patients and patients with things like bowel disease and metabolic disorder. And recent intervention studies also confirmed an inverse correlation of AMUC, that's a shortened version we like to call it here because it's, it's a pretty long one, um, abundance with body weight, inflammation, metabolic syndrome, and type 2 diabetes. So how exactly does this work? And John's going to go into this a little bit more on the next slide. Um, but basically, acromantia mucinophilia, this word mucinophilia translates to affinity of mucin. It likes to eat that mucin. Okay, so acromantia breaks down mucin and turns them into short chain fatty acids. This is going to get really technical. Just stay with me, including acetate. Acetate is used by other beneficial bacteria like firmicutes to make butyrate, which is a vital energy source for the cells lining your gut. This all works together. It is thought that acromancia produces short chain fatty acids such as acetic acid from mucin and supplies energy to goblet cells that produce mucin. Metformin, an anti-diabetic drug, is suggested to also increase the number of goblet cells, thereby enhancing mucin production, thickening that intestinal mucus layer I talked about earlier, and maintaining the intestinal barrier mechanism. And this contributes to that anti-inflammatory effect and consequently it's diabetic, anti-diabetic action. So um, I'm gonna let John go into it in a little bit more detail here. Thanks, Kristen. Um, so as uh, Kristen was pointing out, um, one of the key roles that acromantia plays is in um, helping the healthy ecosystem to thrive. And uh, one of the realizations, you know, researchers have been looking into this as to how does this, how does this work? And one aspect of it is this cro what's called cross feeding and cross feeding is when uh, one strain needs essential metabolites from another strain, but the flip side is also true that that strain then provides essential metabolites to the, to the strain. So they're linked. So it's not just that one strain is getting a benefit in a one way uh, street. It's a two way road. Um, and so acromancia um, is actual, the physical position of acromancia uh, is uh, very unique because it's allowed to be directly on the lining. As Kristen points out, it actually uh, uses as an energy source uh, mucin. So you can see them kind of depicted here as these long chain things coming off of the, the, the bottom of the, of the screen. And so it breaks down the mucin and provides a material for uh, other strains, especially butyrate producing strains uh, to munch on. So that includes acetate, as Kristen mentioned, as well as propionate uh, and other molecules. And so now these butyrate producers use that uh, those substrates themselves, uh, and then they produce butyrate, which is helpful for your lining, uh, as well as uh, producing material that the, the acromantia itself uses. So then it creates this virtuous cycle where uh, having a healthy amount of acromantia results in healthy amount of uh, butyrate producing bacteria. And then those in turn result in um, stabilizing and helping to have a, a healthy amount of, of acromantia. So we can go to the next slide. 
And this is kind of a little bit of a zoom out of that. Uh, so on, on the top part, you can see kind of a, a reproduction of the previous slide in that cross feeding mode. Uh, and then this is just showing now the cascade of potential health effects uh, that, that are that are resulting from that. And so researchers have been digging into well, what is the mechanism for why there is this you know, correlation that Kristen was mentioning, like you, th there tends to be a high correlation with both butyrate producer abundance and acromancy abundance uh, in healthy individuals versus those that have metabolic syndrome versus those that potentially have some of these uh, inflammation uh, issues. Uh, and the reason comes down to two kind of broad areas. One is helping the, you know, your cells and your lining to be uh, tightly, you know, located next to each other to kind of form a nice tight barrier. So it reduces gut permeability. Uh, and that's the thing that, you know, helps on the systemic inflammation side of things. Uh, and what, what's known uh, technically as metabolic endotoxemia, which is that when you, when you eat, you can get these kind of uh, higher increased amounts of um, LPS and other things that get across the barrier that create inflammation in other parts of your body. Um, the other aspect uh, that, you know, we certainly uh, delved into in our first formulation, PGC, is how it actually can help improve metabolism. So there are some specialized cells uh, in your gut lining called L cells. Uh, and they uh, produce uh, molecules that are, that are you know, necessary for you to handle uh, glucose load. So things like GLP-1. Uh, and it turns out that those cells need signaling. They're tightly in, in concert, work tightly in concert with signaling from the strains, these kind of healthy strains in, in, your, in your gut line. So they, they require that in order to help you know, do their function. And so it turns out that that, that has a, an impact on um, your capability, your body's capability of, of, of handling uh, sugar. And so the next slide, we can actually go into a little bit more detail there. Um, this is a, a preclinical uh, work. So this is done in uh, a mouse model. Uh, and uh, this group uh, published on this, uh, you know, about over a year ago, showing that uh, acromancia is, uh, creates, creates a protein that in directly on its own induces these specialized L cells I was telling you about to produce GLP-1. Uh, and as I said, like GLP-1 is, is, is important and has been studied actually, um, pharmaceuticals, you know, create kind of artificial versions of this GLP-1 analogs directly to address diabetes. And the, these are on the market already. Uh, but GLP-1 is the, the natural one that's produced by, by your body. And it is, as, you know, critical for your body's response to, um, you know, meals. Uh, and so what's shown here, the left graph uh, is to do with weight. The uh, black line is uh, low-fat diet, mice on low-fat diet. So you see they're, they're gaining weight as they age, but, but only a little bit. The red line is high-fat diet, and not unexpectedly, they're gaining a lot more weight. Uh, and then the green lines are um, high-fat diet mice, but then given this protein that uh, is secreted by acromancy. So you can see that it uh, significantly reduces the, the amount of uh, weight gain. And on the right is a uh, sugar spike uh, measurement. So now the x-axis there is time in minutes. And what that test is, is when you're given, um, you know, a, a glucose load, uh, your blood sugar, you know, spikes up. And a measure of health is the fact that, you know, that that spike doesn't go up too high and that it uh, dies off uh, quickly. So the area under that curve, the, the smaller it is, the better uh, it is. So the black line, again, uh, is low fat diet uh, mice. The red line is high fat diet mice. And the green one is the high fat diet mice, given this uh, protein that acromancia makes. So there's now an understanding of the, some of the, the, the mechanism by which acromancia can directly affect um, uh, metabolic uh, health. 